Hello everyone. So in this free lecture tutorial, I'm going to describe how it is that we describe the electron domain geometry and the molecular geometry for those molecules and polyatomic ions that have expanded octets. So if you recall yesterday's lesson in the pre-lecture tutorial that preceded it, essentially what we did is we took a look at the geometries of molecules and polyatomic ions that had no more than four electron domains. And so we covered linear and trigonal planar and tetrahedral electron domain geometry, and then we broke it down as to how the existence of lone pairs on the central atom influence the molecular geometries that we observed. Now we're going to do the same, but for those molecules that have five or six electron domains. And so let's start off by considering this particular compound, chlorine trifluoride. I'm going to start off by drawing the Lewis structure for chlorine trifluoride. So again, if you recall, chlorine has seven valence electrons. There are three fluorines, and each fluorine also has seven valence electrons. And so that would be 21 plus 7, that's 28 valence electrons. So if I go ahead and draw out the Lewis structure, I'll attach the fluorines to the chlorine, and that's six electrons that I've used so far. I need to distribute 22 more valence electrons, so that would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. And so what I have here is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. There are 5 electron domains here. And if I break this down further, three of those domains are bonding pairs of electrons, referring to the single bonds, but I have two lone pairs. And so let's take a look at what the five electron domain geometries look like. Basically, if I have five electron domains, the way that they would be arranged within the structure of the central atom is like this. Basically, I'd have three atoms in a flat plane around the central atom, and then the other two would be situated above and below. So that would give me a 90 degree bond angle when I consider the atoms that are above and below the central atom as compared to the ones that are on the horizontal plane. And then within the horizontal plane, if I take a look at this angle from this bond to that bond, that would be 100 de uh, 120 degrees, sorry. And so if I take a look at what shape that gives me, if I go ahead and connect some of these atoms together, basically what I've got, I've got a shape that sort of looks like two pyramids stacked one on top of the other sharing a floor. Here's that shared floor. And since these pyramids are three-sided, we call this geometry trigonal bipyramidal. And again, since there are no lone pairs on the central atom in this particular figure, then the molecular geometry and the electron geometry are the same as each other, and so the molecular geometry would also be trigonal bipyramidal. Now, what's going to happen is, as I start to consider adding lone pairs, as opposed to having all of my five domains being bonding pairs, the way that it works is the lone pairs will start to occupy spaces in the horizontal plane first. Now, in order for you to get a sense for the shape that we're going to get when we start adding lone pairs, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this model and slide it over a little bit. I'm going to slide it over so that it's sort of tilted a little bit more in this direction. Okay, and here's that lone pair that I added. So here I have five domains, four are bonding pairs, and I have one lone pair. Okay, now what I get when I actually 
get that type of arrangement around a central atom, it's still going to be trigonal by pyramidal geometry, because again, if I add the number of electron domains together, I still get five electron domains. But the presence of the lone pair will actually cause me to get this arrangement. Remember that again, when we're dealing with molecular geometry, I'm only considering the atoms and the bonds. The lone pairs don't factor into the name of the molecular geometry itself. When I take a look at that, essentially what I've got is this piece right here, and then these two legs, if you will. And basically what it looks like is a seesaw that you would see at a playground. You can almost imagine somebody sitting here, another person sitting there, and basically the seesaw moving back and forth. And so we call this geometry seesaw shaped. If I go ahead and remove another pair, suppose I go and I take this bond and yank it off and put a lone pair in its place, then basically I'm going to get this arrangement. Now again, I've also rotated this model a little bit so you can appreciate the shape that we see. But here I have three bonding pairs, and I have two lone pairs. Okay, I still have five electron domains, but because of that I still consider this geometry trigonal by pyramidal. But now, since I have these two lone pairs, then when I consider the shape that the atoms and the bonds make, without looking at those lone pairs, I get this piece and then this piece. Basically it looks like a giant letter T. And so the molecular geometry for something that has three bonding pairs and two lone pairs would be T-shaped. Now if I go ahead and remove that final bond and replace it with another lone pair, I simply get this. Basically I get two bonding pairs, and three lone pairs, and again that's still six, I'm sorry, that's still five electron domains, but now if I take a look at the shape I have left behind, I only have these two atoms connected to the central atom in one straight line, and so when I have three lone pairs and two bonding pairs around a central atom, it's still trigonal by pyramidal in its electron domain geometry, but the molecule essentially just looks like a straight line if I don't consider the appearance of the lone pairs, and so I consider that molecule uh, linear. So if we take a look at the Lewis structure we drew, again we have the three bonding pairs and two lone pairs, and if you recall, that would actually be the configuration that would give me a T-shaped molecule. And so as a result, we would expect chlorine trifluoride to be T-shaped. Now, what about iodine pentafluoride? So again, iodine has seven valence electrons. Fluorine, of which there are five of them in this molecule, normally has seven valence electrons as well. Seven times five is 35 plus seven, that's 42 valence electrons. So I'm going to go ahead and assemble the structure. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and fill in my electrons. So far I used 10 valence electrons since I added 5 single bonds. I need to add 32 more valence electrons. So that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, and 32. And so basically what I've got there is I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. That would be 6 electron domains. Okay, of those 6 domains, 5 are bonding pairs, 1 is a lone pair. And so let's take a look and see what the geometries for six electron domain central atoms look like. So if I actually have a figure that actually represents six electron domains, I get the following shape, where if I connect everything, now this looks like a four-sided pyramid 
where I'm stacking them, again, sharing a floor, similar to the trigonal bipyramidal geometry, but just act, um, adding an extra side. And so basically what that gives me is it gives me an eight-sided three-dimensional figure. Now we call these things octahedrons. And so for that reason, we call this electron domain geometry octahedral. If it turns out that I have no other lone pairs around my central atom, then I would also consider the molecular geometry to also be octahedral. Now, if I have one lone pair, then that changes the geometry slightly. Basically, if I remove this bottom bond, then basically what's going to happen is I lose that pyramid shape that would occur in the bottom of this double pyramid that's stacked floor to floor. And so instead, what that's going to give me is something that looks like just one pyramid, but the floor of the pyramid actually is square shaped as opposed to triangular shaped. And so when I have one lone pair, but five bonding pairs for a total of six electron domains, because I get this square floor on a pyramid shape, then basically I call that particular molecular geometry square pyramidal, even if the electron domain geometry, because I still have six electron domains, we call it octahedral. If I go ahead and remove another of these bonds, I'm going to remove this bond on top to get two lone pairs. So then I'm going to have two lone pairs and four bonding pairs. I still have six electron domains so that the electron domain geometry stays octahedral, but now, again, ignoring the presence of the lone pairs for the visual aspect of the molecular geometry, I get a shape that's flat but square. All right, and so because of that, basically I call this geometry square planar. If I were to remove another electron, so uh, remove another pair of bonding electrons, I should say, let's say I'm going to remove, say, that particular bond. Basically what I'm going to get is, and I did a little rotation on this bond so you could see it better, when I have three lone pairs, but three bonding pairs as well, because I have the six electron domains, then it's still octahedral, but now the molecule is T-shaped. Now, if I remove yet another bonding pair, in this case I'll remove this bonding pair uh, right here, basically what I'm going to get is four lone pairs this time with only two bonding pairs. Again, still for a total of six electron domains. But because the electron ge geometry is still octahedral for those six electron domains, since I'm missing four of these bonding pairs, I only have four lone pairs and two bonding pairs instead, the appearance of the molecule just looks like a simple straight line. And so as a result, the molecular geometry would be linear when I have this combination of lone pairs and bonding pairs. Another thing of note related to the octahedral geometry is if I take a look at the bond angles, basically this type of geometry is unique because essentially I get a 90 degree angle between this flat plane and the top and bottom uh, bonds within the structure around the central atom, but then at the same time, I also have a 90 degree bond angle within the flat plane between each of these four atoms on the flat plane. So if I take a look at the structure that I drew, I have five bonding pairs and one lone pair. And if we cross reference to our discussion earlier, then we can see that basically I should be expecting square pyramidal geometry for 
that type of molecule. So go ahead and work on the follow-up assignment. Again, we're going to be reinforcing this over the next couple of days just to make sure that you have the skill down. If there are any questions, by all means, email or ask your questions in class. And I'll see you in class next time. Good night.